Kuzangpo and welcome to Dawi Gurin. I have Honorable Opposition Leader Mr. Tsring Topki here. Uh, as I already announced in our Zonka session that probably this could be the last opportunity for Honorable Opposition uh, and the Opposition Party as a guest uh, for Dawi Gurin. Of course, there will be other forms of opportunities as well, but that would be more towards election and other political businesses. As an opposition leader, there are things that uh, our viewers would want to know. And as we had uh, already had uh, interactions in Zonka session, I would like to straight away go into the State of the Nation report uh, presented by Honorable Prime Minister. Your reaction to it? One, of course, now people know that it's on rupee. Any other concerns that you would like to raise here? Well, that time I, uh, I told you which areas I agree with. But I qualified them with uh, some of our other concerns regarding the uh, roads, electricity, uh, mobile connectivity, and also hydropower construction. Uh, but before I get into the other areas of my concern, let's remind ourselves that this first elected government had a wonderful, a fantastic opportunity. The 10 plan was prepared. The uh, funds for the 10 plan was mobilized already. Even though they are by members of this existing government, they were mobilized in their capacities as ministers in the old government. Uh, we had a, a population that gave them a huge mandate. In the parliament, they had 45 out of 47. They had a, a very experienced cabinet. And most of all, they had uh, our monarchy, our king, our monarch, as uh, providing steadfast support. So we actually had absolutely no reason to perform any less than spectacular in the last five years. But uh, be as things may be, uh, yes, there are certain causes for con uh, concern. So the first one I express is rupee. Uh, today we have a rupee shortage, a short-term borrowing. This is not the overall general loan, short-term credit of almost, in fact, more than 18.5 billion rupees. This is huge by any standards. And according to, uh, it's about 26% of our GDP. It's huge. How are we going to pay it? The government is still in denial. The government still does not accept responsibility. And the government does not have a plan. Instead, they say that, uh, well, we have increased our foreign exchange reserves. That is wrong. In 2010, our foreign currency reserves stood at over $900 million. $900 million in 2010. Today, it is only $866 million as uh, pointed out by the uh, Prime Minister. So we do have a problem when it comes to the rupee. The second big concern we in the opposition have is the state of our economy. There's a huge imbalance. Structurally, our economy is, uh, is very risky. Imports exceed uh, exports by as much as 14 billion, according to the Prime Minister's own uh, report on the state of the nation. He said uh, imports were 40 billion and imports were just 26, exports were just 26 billion as opposed to exp uh, imports of 40 billion. That imbalance is not sustainable. Now add to that we have a growing debt. Our overall debt stands at 79 billion rupees, uh, null terms. 79 billion null terms. That is almost like 80% of our GDP. And that does not include the short-term borrowings. Our economy is, uh, is, is in risk, is not sustainable. So, uh, uh, if I'm to interrupt, now, if you were in the government, how differently you would have done to solve this rupee issue? Because the fundamental truth that we as Bhutanese, we should all know is that rupee is a foreign currency. But the problem we have here in our country is that Rupee is seen as our own currency, and it's pecked at par with our new terms as well. So people have no reason to believe that rupee is a foreign currency. That's one problem. And the economic situation around the world is also seen uh, struggling and uh, falling apart. Mm. This can also be one of the reasons that could be attributed to our rupee situation. Well, the first thing is uh, people's perception of Niltram being the same as rupee and rupee using rupee uh, as and when we wish. If that is a problem, that is a problem created by the government. If that is a problem, that is a problem that must be addressed by the government. You can't just say, this is how the public treat the rupee and the nildrum. If there is a problem of perception, if people don't understand, the government's job is to set that right. And that's through policy. The second is, 
Internationally, we had financial crises, yes. And what is the financial crisis? Not having access to capital. In Bhutan's case, our GDP is accelerating. The amount of money, investments coming into the country is phenomenal. That's why IMS has rated us the fourth fastest growing economy. And a lot of that money is coming through hydropower projects. So that, just because the rest of the world is having a problem, doesn't mean that uh, uh, that, uh, that problem is affecting us. Our figures point otherwise. And in spite of all that, we have rupee problems. So that is a cause for grave concern. Now, what would we do? Uh, we need to improve our economy. We need to produce more. Our agriculture is suffering. In spite of the glowing reports that the Prime Minister gave the nation, the fact of the matter is agriculture accounts for just 15.5% of the GDP. We import almost all our agricultural produce. We are not manufacturing enough. We have all our eggs in one basket, hydropower. GDP is driven by that, hydropower. So we need to diversify. Doing business, the World Bank's report on the ease of doing business. In 2008, they ranked Bhutan 118. Bad, but not too bad. Today, 2013, they ranked Bhutan 148 out of 178 countries. We've slid all the way down. Every indicator on the ease of doing business has taken a hit in Bhutan. I think the government should take this seriously. We need to look at these indicators and the ease of starting a business, access to credit, uh, trade between countries across borders, even closing a business, construction permits. There's a host of issues that this ease of doing business index uh, condemns actually Bhutan. So there's a whole lot we can do. But to move on, the other concerns, farm roads, on the face of it, very successful. The DPT government has built farm roads all over the country, 3,300 kilometers. I think that is good, it is commendable, and we would have done the same. But the quality of the farm road is questionable. The design of the farm road, some are too steep, some are too narrow, some are too dangerous. They are going to need immense amount of money just to maintain them. Our farmers could end up being disappointed because their farm roads are not actually motor roads. So this is another cause for concern. I think in five years, they, if they wanted to build farm roads, we would have supported them, but they should have built farm roads that are pliable, that are usable. Sticking with farms, we have farmers, 69%, according to the government, 69% of our population depend on farm activities. Yet, in spite of all the glowing reports of the Prime Minister in the farming sector, in the agricultural sector, fact of the matter, according to him, in the last five years, they've distributed just 100 power tillers. And that too is government and private, not just government. They've helped out with only 79 greenhouses. Can you imagine? 79 greenhouses for the entire agricultural population, and they've built just 75 kilometers of irrigation channel. So there too, uh, in spite of the fact now, uh, the government claims to have halved those, the amount of uh, population living below the poverty line from 23 to 12. And I, I've asked the National Statistical Bureau for information on that. Their report is still not released. We don't even know whether to believe the government's figures or not. They haven't still released the report. Okay, sir. So maybe to interrupt, uh, one issue on agriculture. Now, agriculture, as you pointed out, uh, Your Excellency, you believe that uh, government has not done enough on agriculture sector. Don't you think this could be a problem of education? Because the concern of the government or the state is that uh, almost every business should be educated. And because people are educated now, not many would want to work in the farms. And we have this issue of rural urban migration. So don't you no, think that, that could be the reason? Firstly, if that was the problem, then, then we should be concerned because then policies are not being synchronized. Policies are not being coordinated. So if you have agricultural policy go in one direction, education policy go in another direction, then we should be even more alarmed. But education is good, regardless. And those who are educated would make better workers, regardless of what profession they undertake, including farming. But the environment has to be right. The environment must be supportive. Our agricultural practices should be such that it allows educated youth, it invites educated youth to a productive life of farming, and that's where we are missing out. There are some uh, interested youth coming up uh, by now 
and it's an individual's choice, would you still blame the government for this? Oh, yes, because it's the government's job to set the policy environment correct. The environment must be conducive and enabling. The environment must be supportive. If it is really, really supportive, you and I will go back to farming. But if you just leave it up to the individual, you, you, you educate people and just leave it up to them, obviously they will take, uh, they, they'll make sensible choices. If farming is just drudgery and it's going to be unproductive and it's just going to be subsistence, who among us wants to go back? We have to create a more enabling environment for our farming. And on the other hand, we are talking of a population of under 700,000. Is it too much to ask to grow enough food for ourselves? We okay. grew enough food in the past, but now we are not. So we really need to have a long, hard look at what we consider successes. We really need to evaluate our policies, review our policies, and set ourselves right. Okay. Uh, so moving on, uh, maybe if you have one or two points here, briefly. And yeah, then unemployment. I, can move on to some other I mentioned unemployment. Again, the figures are rosy, but I have two problems with that. One is we have literally hundreds, even thousands of our youth unemployed, even graduates unemployed. And the Prime Minister himself said for 394 jobs in the civil service, 394 jobs in the civil service, 2,397 graduates applied. We should be alarmed that so many graduates applied and they wouldn't have got jobs. But the other reason I'm concerned is we are... We have no option but to accept the figures given to us by the government, although the figures were produced by the Ministry of Labor. And it is the Ministry of Labor's, there's a conflict of interest. It is in their interest to declare lower results, and they are the ones doing the survey. Another area of concern is the democratic institutions. This government has gone out of its way to actually undermine the growth of democratic institutions, in right. spite of what the Honorable Prime Minister has said. Well, after the constitutional case, the judiciary took a big hit. The government threatened to resign. Let's not forget that. And the government lashed out at the judiciary. Let's not forget that. In big public gatherings during the midterm review, saying you're not going to get your water, your roads, because now we can't raise taxes because of the judiciary. But don't you think that's, politi that's politics? Uh, this is what politics is all about. Well, that's bad politics, though. It's not honest politics. And it is politics that will undo the strength of our institutions institutions that are critical for our democracy. Opposition, they've made no doubt about attacking the opposition, and, well, I'm not going to complain about that, but the National Council, they've been labelled as the opposition. Early on, they were labelled as the opposition, and that was not correct. And, of course, there's the media. The media, at times, were threatened. At times, the, the, the government would pander to them. But, Did uh, government label the National Council as the opposition? Or was it uh, the neutral individuals in the country, or was it because uh, was it uh, the people who are not uh, within the government? Well, members of the ruling party said on record in parliament, even in the joint sitting, that the NC is behaving like the opposition. So we'll leave it at that. And uh, and then there's this government's arbitrariness. Instead of following democratic process, instead of consulting people. Uh, whether it's a petition day, uh, suddenly closing imports of certain uh, goods, uh, declaring ourselves carbon neutral without consulting the parliament, consulting the people, it may be good, but may be bad. In a democracy, we need to at least have a little bit of consultation. But sir, there are so many issues that the government amended or corrected after so much of uh, concerns raised by the people. Don't you think uh, those are the cases of consultation? That's very good. It's unfortunate that it got to that stage. If they had consulted, it wouldn't have got there. That is the point. But say, even if you were in the government, would you go consulting for every issue? With oh, no, no, no. Because then if that's the case, you won't no, be able to work. There's a process, Dawa. Consultation doesn't mean you consult each and every citizen. I mean, you, some, some issues you may have to. Huh? But when you talk of consultation, it is a process. It's not just a cabinet issuing an executive order. There's a process. And if there isn't one, you develop that process. You allow people to speak, and the government should listen to them. But when you don't have that in place, or you don't respect it, and you're arbitrary, one day you're that, next day you're something else, that's, that's dangerous. And that's not good for a democracy. 
Okay, sir. Uh, moving on. Uh, how prepared as BDP? Now, some of the defectors, people may call it. Some of your uh, BDP candidates have left, and now they are in a different party. Uh, they have already registered, and they are with a different party. Now, they say that uh, they are not with PDP because PDP is not prepared at all. And uh, you have established yourself as an opposition leader, but you ignored the party. And because of that, uh, yeah. they're not even sure if PDP would be able to go for the primary round. This is some, what some expected to say. Well, first, don't call them defectors. They're not defectors. But they say that uh, no, no. some of the PDP supporters call them as defectors. I'm a PDP person, I'm a PDP member and a supporter, and I'm requesting you don't call them defectors. So, uh, okay, sir, these are not my words, <laughs> so, so I'm recalling it anyway. So anyway, it's what they said versus what I am saying, right? So anyway, don't call them defectors, and they shouldn't think of themselves as defectors. Uh, which party they join is their business, an individual's business. Now, if they left the party because PDP was weak, they should have stayed and strengthened it. In fact, a few years ago, when a few of the party members, ex-candidates, wanted to leave, I pleaded with them. I said, look, our party is in bad shape, yes. We have huge loans, yes. We don't have a president. Even though I was appointed the president, I never took charge. I never accepted it fully. So we don't have proper leadership. Our president, Lumbasange, had resigned on moral grounds. So we didn't have leadership, yes. We have only two members in the opposition, yes. The future looks bleak, yes. But I said, this is the worst time to leave the party. The party needs you. Take over the party, I said. If you're going to leave to do some other work, if you're not interested in politics, good. But if you're leaving to start a new party, don't do that. Take over the PDP. Identify your own president. We will support you from below. This is what my exact words to them were. You, know, you don't have to leave the party. Establish your own priorities and your ideology. And we in the opposition, at least I, will tow your line and work in accordance to your priorities. We appealed not to leave and instead you channel your positive energy into rebuilding PDP. But they left. They are entitled to leave, but they shouldn't blame us now to say that we were not ready and we may not get into the primary rounds. I think that is politics of the worst nature. We are ready, as ready as we should be four months before the elections. We have a membership base. We've organized ourselves. We have almost 40 members, candidates confirmed. We've declared 25, but we have almost 40 confirmed. Some of them are senior civil servants who we can't declare right now. Okay, so, so we are ready. And in, uh, as far as establishing myself as opposition leader, come on, we have only two members in opposition, and both of us worked hard. It was scary. We felt alone. It was a new job in opposition, but we, had, we tried our best. So don't say that we made ourselves as opposition, names for ourselves as opposition, or myself as opposition leader. I think that what our friends should understand is that we didn't, in the party, grab the leadership, hog the leadership to say that now I am the president or I'm the vice president. This is my party. You do as I say. Yes. Uh, so, one issue. Now, I wouldn't say many would say this. The problem in the this media is that we often try to claim that uh, many people would say this, many people said that, when the fact is that we just land up talking to one or two individuals. So let me say that I did talk to some individuals, and they say that uh, Your Excellency, as an opposition leader, you are not for consensual politics. You are rather for divisive politics. And because of that, uh, there were not many instances of you supporting or applauding the initiatives taken by government, as if government is all for failures. I, I, I take that point and uh, I think uh, being divisive, uh, I'm going to purposely use that word, it's your word, as an opposition is much more good for democracy, a young democracy, 
than being, again, your word, consensual. Uh, it, for a two-member opposition, the easiest thing would be to toe the government's line, to please the government, and get what we want as individually. That would be the easiest thing to do. And outwardly, you heckle about things that are superficial, not important. But inside, you trade horses, and you profit. That would be the easiest, but the most corrupt thing. And in fact, if people think that we are more divisive than consensual, I'll take it as a compliment. So one issue that is raised is when it comes to some international events, or when it comes to some international matters, seen in many countries, that opposition and the government easily could come together and have some consensus built and go for it. But uh, here in our case, because the opposition is there to oppose, is what people believe. Some, some would believe. You have not agreed on some international matters as well. For instance, the UN Security Council bit, uh, non-permanent membership for UN Security Council. We thought we made that clear. Uh, and uh, what we had told the media during a press conference is that we kept quiet. We disagreed with it, but we kept quiet because it was an important foreign policy initiative of this government. And in our quietness was support. We didn't agree with the initiative, but we remained quiet. We never questioned this once. We disagreed with it from the day one. We thought it was too expensive, we thought it was too undoable, and we thought that even if we got into the UN Security Council, it wouldn't be in the best interest of Bhutan. But we never uttered a word because it is an important foreign policy initiative. Don't you think that was the mistake you made? Uh, if you felt that, if wow. you strongly felt that uh, <laughs> there was no need for our government to go ahead, you could have well, reminded them before it's on. What I'm saying is, this was an important foreign policy initiative, and therefore we felt, as an international initiative, even though we didn't agree with it, we need to keep quiet, and in our quietness, in our silence, show some support. So, it, so sir, that was support. But, sir, it was as if like, you waited for the government to fail and then you jumped on it. Yes. Even if they succeeded, we would have made our comments. So, basically, with your line of question, I can't give you any reason because uh, if you keep quiet, we are wrong. If you, if you, if you comment, we are wrong. We, we can't justify ourselves either way. But hear this. We kept quiet, even though we didn't agree with it, because it was an important foreign policy initiative and we needed to show a united front to the rest of the world. When it was over, it was our responsibility then, because it was over, to say things as we saw it. Yes. Sir, one more question on PDP. Any possibility of Honorable Lumbo Sangiru coming back? Like, because there's a rumor, rumors making around that Lumbo might come back and some say Lumbo is not going to come back. And as you pointed out, Lumbo resigned on moral grounds. And some say, why would he come back? But again, lots of rumors going on. A lot of people have uh, been asking the same question. A lot of people have been visiting uh, Limbo Sange in his home and uh, really appealing for him to come back. A lot of our candidates have been visiting him also. Uh, I certainly hope that he comes back. He's good for the nation. He's proven himself. And God knows the country needs him now. Uh, but uh, so far, he, he, he's, he's, he's been quite uh, steadfast in his views that uh, he will not. But let's see. We are, we are still hopeful. Let's see. Uh, but earlier you were telling me about uh, some of our earlier colleagues who had left and uh, uh, said something about uh, their anti-PTP or something like that. No, that was off the record line. In fact, ah, okay. okay, okay. So please, if you want to answer, because this is what I heard from some of the supporters of Nyamrup. Okay, that okay, because okay. they left and formed Nyamrup, they are seen as anti PDP. No, no. I mean, you can leave a party and start a new party, yeah? But when you leave a new party, when you leave one party and start another party, you definitely can't be pro that earlier party. Yeah. Whether you're anti or not, well, let's, let's just say. We have five parties, and all five parties should be anti each other. Otherwise, there's no business of being separate parties. 
So the fact that they are anti, they shouldn't feel uh, any bad. Uh, they shouldn't feel bad, and uh, it, we shouldn't mince our words. All the parties are anti one another. In fact, in this context, we have some people going around saying, oh, PDP, Nyamrop, we're the same. That cannot be. We are not the same. You could have had Devila Mithemelo. Nyamrop, Seru, Masa Sokpa, Seru, Chin, say. So Sogunya vote for one. Sogunya Katitsuru, Tupse. They lie at that Nyamrop, the Masa Sokpa, Chim, let them debate, thing, Achit Chika, Bewachin, Tupse. Debate, man, thing, Achit, Masa Gil, Lamludit. PDP is different from Nyamrop. We are different parties. If we are the same, then election commission should jump on us. So people should not mistake of voting for one, believing it as other. Well, okay. I think we should make ourselves very clear. We have five different parties, and all five parties are separate. In the case of Druk Nyamrup Sokpa and People's Democratic Party, Mr. Mazu Sokpa, we are two independent, separate parties with two ideologies and hopefully two different sets of policies offering the nation two different choices. So we cannot be the same. Okay, sir. Yes, some of our earlier friends have joined Nyamrup, but that's okay. And that but that certainly does not mean that we are the same party. So they, if you suspect that, you know, put your suspicions to rest. And if you claim that we are the same, don't do it. Okay, sir. Final question, sir. Briefly, there's this uh, fractions created uh, by the political parties during 2008 elections. One group has PDP, and other group has uh, DPT. Mm. Now we have uh, three, three more. more new parties, and what was two in 2008 is going to be five mm. now. So, are you going to work uh, for this? Because small country, small society, we don't want to see too many fractions and unhealthy divisions created. I think the Bhutanese are mature enough. I think we know. We are wise enough, and now we are experienced enough to so understand. Do you that to understand the muslinging allegations. Uh, this to time understand around? that uh, political parties and politicians are not the be all and the end all. That life continues after that. Yeah, so, as a matter of fact, the more the merrier. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. On this note, more the merrier. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Levi Dahar. And, uh, probably, as said earlier, this would be our last opportunity to be our guest on Davi Kutin. Thank, Thank you. you for your time. Thank La. you. With this, we would like to end our program. Thank you so much for watching Davi Kutin. Now it's time for 10 o'clock uh, news bulletin. La. Thank you.